train is full and it's leaving the station. <laughs> well, what a pleasure to see this great turnout. Welcome back for our dear Professor Dana Scott. I think he hasn't been here in two whole years. So it's great to have him back giving this first purified logic colloquium of the year. I'll take a moment for those of you who are not familiar with Dana to give a brief introduction. It's hard to give an introduction for a man who needs no introduction. I'll try. Dana was a Hillman University professor here for about 20 years, from 1981 to 2003. Uh, he was in the departments of computer science, mathematics, and philosophy. Uh, I think it's fair to say he was the center of mass of the logic solar system here at Carnegie Mellon. He drew in a great deal of talent and uh, activity in logic here in all three departments centered around his presence. It's great to have him here. Uh, and uh, his legacy here at CMU is evident in all of the logic activity that's here today. Before being here, he uh, played a similar role at several other institutions. At Oxford, for that Berkeley, Stanford, Princeton, and he left behind a long train of uh, trail of uh, leading logicians, students, collaborators, world centers of logical activity. Of course, Dane has made fundamental contributions to all areas of logic and the foundations of computer science. Far too many for me to list here, but his uh, contributions were recognized with a Turing Award, with a Shock Prize for logic, and many other distinctions. It's a great pleasure to have him back. Thank you, Dana, and thank you also, let me say, for uh, opening the weekend uh, Category Theory Oktoberfest. There are many category theorists, too, who count you also among their uh, grandfathers of their discipline. So thanks for being here, Dave. Welcome. Thank you, Steve, and thank you and all your helpers for making the trip possible. Appreciate it. Hey, guys in the back, there are a few seats empty here if you want to come to sit down. There's a seat there, there's a seat over there, and there's a seat in the back. You can come around. Uh, the ones in the corner there, you can come around. There. Steve, for the uh, Oktoberfest, is this the room where the lectures will be in? No, it's going to be in the Adamson way. Oh, upstairs, the big, the big auditorium. Down the hall, not the great big one, directly across from the Philosophy main office and downstairs. Great. Adamson. Great. Baker Hall 136A. So I want to speak today rather programmatically about what some people have called explicit mathematics. Maybe the title should be what I would like to see as a way to do explicit mathematics. So we'll see here and I'll give some background of where the ideas came from. But first, I want to uh, dedicate this to my dear friend. It's been really difficult to get sad messages. I'm 85. And I, I was 21 before I knew anyone personally who had died. My grandparents had died when I was just very young, and so I didn't have any experience of losing friends. Unfortunately, at this age, it happens too often. It was terrible. to say goodbye. Now we've just had with the category theory the very sad news that Fred Litton and Miles Tierney passed away recently. Amazing characters, very fundamental for the development of modern category theory. I knew them very well. And of course there was the shock that Vladimir Borovsky died suddenly at age 51. That, that really is terrible. So it was um, a couple or maybe two and a half years ago, one weekend my wife 
and I got three messages, four messages, of people that we knew very well that had passed away. So I was sitting in the gloomy of my study in the late afternoon, and I thought to myself the following thought. Life produces such surprises. Death removes such essentials. I especially want to point out that about the work of Pfefferman, the Sanford department has left up his website. I complained to other departments when special professors left or passed away that they eliminated their websites and so you lose track of uh, things here. But you can find lots about Pfefferman's uh, publications and his career there and their pictures and other things uh, as well. So he formulated in the mid-70s <coughs> a program of explicit mathematics and then it expanded very much and he approached it especially from the proof theoretic angle and it's had a very 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 big development and Gerhard Jaeger was one of his special disciples uh, and so very recently in honor of uh, Jaeger he reviewed uh, the program that he set up that's still ongoing with many people working on it, and I'm sure you can get that paper uh, from his uh, website. But he also wanted to expand the ideas, especially uh, in light of his work on predicativity, and so there's a lot of work thinking about transfinite analogs that are proof theoretically meaningful for transfinite cardinals there. I'm not going to talk about any of that today. It's not my area, and so I just referred you to Pfefferman and his collaborators for those proof theoretic studies. Back in the mid-70s, he pointed out that There's a lot of non-constructiveness that goes on in mathematics. And so the question is, which part of it can be called constructive in some sense? And of course, he says very truly there that you really don't need very many levels. And that's what I'm going to restrict to today. Integers, sets of integers, sets of sets of integers. You can do an awful lot of mathematics just on those levels. Set theoreticians love those transfinite cardinals. But it turned out that it's rather hard to make use of those transfinite cardinals for down-to-earth results. So it was really quite amazing when Tony Martin proved that uh, long unsolved problems about determinants of infinitary games given by uh, Borel sets giving the winning of uh, the games there. And so he showed that all Borel games are, are uh, determinate. That is, there is a strategy for the one player or the other. And he had to use the transfinite iteration of power set of power set of power set through all the countable ordinal numbers in order to do that. And I think it was Harvey Friedman who proved, see, Tony Martin showed that you could use those transfinite levels to prove something about Borel games. And I, I think Harvey Friedman showed it's essential to use all the levels of it there. So that's really quite amazing. But it goes far beyond what anyone would consider as very explicit mathematics. And so that's a nice point there that you can do something with those transfinite levels. But it's a question. How much do you really want to do? <coughs> and so in that paper, uh, he says, uh, Thurman says, that he wants to keep things of low logical complexity here. And so that's what 
I'm going to try to do. At the time he wrote that paper, he was emphasizing classical logic, but there are, of course, many reasons to also consider things in intuitionistic logic. Now, part of the motivation at the time was Eric Bischoff's book. I knew Eric Bischoff very well. He was an outstanding contributor to functional analysis. But one day he said, all these giant spaces and things like that, they don't have any numerical meaning using ultra filters and other things. There's no numerical meaning to that. So what part of mathematics analysis particularly has numerical meaning? And so he started his program of uh, doing that and wrote his book back there in the late uh, 60s. In the prologue to the book, he said, his objectives were to make concepts affirmative. <coughs> in other words, to give reasons why they really hold. And make sure that you don't go to too abstract things. You have to make definitions relevant. For example, in giving definitions, you want to make sure you have enough information in the definition in order to get to the conclusions you want. So there's a big difference between just pointwise continuity and continuity, uniform continuity on compact intervals, because if you think about uniform continuity, for every epsilon there is a delta such that for all the points in the compact interval something good happens there. So you have much more information to go on if you formulate your hypotheses so that you have what you need to work with. So he shows that over and over again in his presentation. And so those were the purposes of his book, and he had the hope that one day constructive mathematics would be the accepted norm. It isn't. Maybe there's still some hope. However. Now, in the prologue, he justifies himself by saying he's not saying that the very high level idealistic mathematics is worthless. And he's also saying that there is a good challenge there, even if you approach things as he did in his own education from a very idealistic point of view, there's a challenge then to find out what proofs are constructive. His book went out of print, and then he made a pact with Douglas Bridges, who I know very well as well, to rewrite the book, and alas, he died before it. That was finished. But in the meantime, Doug Bridges has done indefatigable work on constructive analysis. And it's just amazing these days with Google, Google Scholar. I start up my laptop, go to Google Scholar, put in a couple of keywords, and then I discover there are at least a dozen or two dozen papers I should have read that I didn't know about. But the good thing is, at least because I have a library account uh, in Berkeley, I can pretty much download the papers. I don't go to the library anymore because it's so amazing what you can get over there. Of course, you still have to read those papers. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, if you just put in Bishop Bridges Constructive, you will be amazed the pages of relevant references there, and you might find something that would be of interest to you. From a different point of view, but by someone who was also motivated by the success that Bishop had of actually doing mathematics in a constructive form, you see Bishop was really put off by Brouwer's approach because Brouwer had a much more philosophical idea and invented new words and all kinds of different ways of saying things. And also in the Browerian uh, presentations, Brouwer decided that certain things in classical mathematics were wrong, and so he has contradictory assumptions with constructive content there. Bishop didn't want to do it that way. He wanted to have all of his proofs done constructively also to be valid classically. 
and that's that's the way he, he uh, his style of writing was uh, that way. Now, Martin Lerf was very interested, of course, in uh, intuitionism, and so he also wanted to see what is needed to expand ordinary, just beginning logic, what is needed to expand that in order to do the kinds of things that Bishop wanted to do. And so um, Martin Lerf has done for many years and with many collaborators a certain approach to the theory of types. One thing I'd like to point out is that Martin Lerf's paper <coughs> themselves, uh, he hasn't published really all that much, but uh, Nordstrom, Peterson, and Smith really rewrote Bartler's monograph in the handbook of logic and computer science, and I think you can even download that over the net. And so that gives a good introduction to Martin Murph's style of type theory. One thing that Martin Murph got caught up in is in the beginning he said, oh good, in thinking about types, I think we should have a type of all types. And so he formulated principles that would allow a type of all types to be a type. And lo and behold, just as Russell found the flaw in Frege's, jean yves Girard, oh, Church, Church's type free theory was found inconsistent by his graduate students, Plenty and Rosser, and jean yves Girard, and then almost simultaneously, uh, John Reynolds found that uh, a certain way of giving a type of types like that is much too free and it leads to uh, a contradiction. Now, lots of people discuss types and types of types and types of types. I'm not going to do that. I think you can do a lot without having more levels. And the reason that I think that is we're really just going to concentrate on quantification over integers, quantification over sets of integers, and quantification over sets of sets of integers, and you'll see how much structure is available there without going to higher types. I don't have anything against those higher types, and there are a lot of interesting reasons. <coughs> There's lots of developments in uh, proof theory, and certainly uh, related to Martin Murph set up there, but I'm not going to go there today. So let's review a little bit about types. So, Russell and then Church, redoing Russell, <coughs> felt that when you take bound variables, they should be type. So if you're trying to give a function from A to B, you should think of the parameter of the function x there to be of type A, and you should be careful to set it up so all the values of f, whatever f could be, turn out to be of type B, and so that's a type uh, function. Now, of course, what happens is when the types are considered just separated from one another, you have to watch out because you may have to convert from one type to the other. So if I take a real polynomial like x squared plus x plus 1, then, of course, substituting values into that gives uh, easy answers. But if you try to substitute in a complex number or a quaternion number, of course, it's undefined. Now, you could go up to the quaternions. And remember that the quaternions contain the complex numbers and contain the reals. And then, of course, one polynomial. Algebra is really lucky. So, quaternions are non-commutative polynomials, but commutative algebra is really lucky that all the community the algebras have the same polynomial rules to follow. Okay. But with strict typing, you have to be careful of uh, making sure that the types uh, match there. Let me just ask a question. Does everybody know that there are a continuum number of subrings of the quaternions isomorphic to the complex numbers, a continuum number of them. Does everybody know that? Some do. Okay. It turns out that quaternions can be considered as quotients of 
three-dimensional vectors. And so you have angles and this, but you have the plane in which the vector is raised. If you keep vectors all in the same plane, passing through the origin, say, those give you a copy of the complex numbers. If and there are continu real. continual number of planes. If the real line is part of that plane. I'm sorry? If the real line is part of that plane. But there'll be copies there along the line. Yeah. There are a continual number of copies of the real line by taking any line through the origin. Because then the things that are just the real space multiple space. along that line. Yeah. Anyway, it's fun to think of types with different kinds of mathematical structures, and I'll try to indicate some, some I think, need some interesting work, I hope. Now, Curry was a type-free person, but of course, Curry did his work completely, I feel, formalistically. In my opinion, Curry is the most formalistic person I ever met. He really only thought in terms of symbols and rules for manipulating symbols. Maybe I'm doing <coughs> memory of the symbols there, but that's my feeling there. And so Curry introduced a lot of typing by saying, well, if we use type-free functions, it may be that it'll turn out that that happens to map some things that we could think of as type A to things of type B. And so we can say, oh, the type-free function respects going from A to B. And then, of course, that same type free function might respect going between two different types. Or if you stop to think about it, the identity function always will go from type A to type A. So this is a polymorphic kind of classification of functions there if things can work out. So, uh, when Martin Lerf gave his original approach to type theory, other people have reformulated Martin Lerf's theory where there are strictly typed functions, but his original one used untyped expressions, and I was really puzzled by that. If you're so concerned with type theory, why are you using untyped functions? But it worked out, and he showed, proof theoretically, that everything was, was okay. But what I want to show you is one model that I think has good mathematical power to it, where the type-free notion of function will be there, but we'll be able to introduce highly structured types as we go along. Now, just to remind you, axiomatizing type-free lambda calculus, Curry gave these names. Alpha conversion means alphabetic conversion, where a bound variable can be written with any alphabetic variant there. You just have to be careful, of course, in the usual ways of not formulating the side conditions, that you don't confuse free and bound variables and inadvertently capture a free variable by another binding there. But basically, you can rewrite bound variables however you please. And then what Curry called beta conversion is, if you define a function and then give it an argument there, then you just have to look in the definition of the function and substitute the argument in there. And uh, again, being careful about free and bound variables. Does anyone know why Curry named beta conversion beta conversion? It's because beta is the second letter of the Greek alphabet. <laughs> <laughs> now, eta conversion, which we thought of as a kind of extensionality, is too strong for me and my model there, because I think of that as saying everything is a function. Everything can be thought of as a function in this no holds barred type free thing. Anything can be a function, anything can be an argument. You can always apply anything to anything else as functional application, and we'll see how it works out. I cannot recommend too highly Cardone and Hindley, Hindley's, uh, Roger Hindley's history of lambda calculus there, 
Again, I think it's easily downloadable over the internet, and it has hundreds and hundreds of references and backgrounds where things came from and what people did with them. Now, to set up the model, I need just a small amount of gradle numbering here. So my argument basically here today is a little bit of numbering, a little bit of topology, a little bit of set theory, and not too much, so we'll see. Now, in doing numbers there, the cheapest pairing function there is just to use uh, factoring of uh, integers and the primes there, so every positive integer can be factored by a power of two times some odd factor there. So every number greater than zero is the Gödel number, if you like to think of it that way, of a pair of integers. Okay? Now if you iterate <coughs> pairing, you can think of that as a way of Gödel numbering finite sequences. So now we can use zero as being the Gödel number of the empty sequence, and then if we want to adjoin another term on the end of a finite sequence, we simply form the ordered pair, according to the first notation there, of a shorter sequence, and then one extra term there. So every integer is the number of a finite sequence of integers, according to this. And of course, it's good that the Gödel number of a sequence is much larger. I mean, it's a giant uh, exponential. It's much larger than the numbers in the terms of the sequence. So when you analyze things of parts, you're always falling back to smaller integers. And of course, there are many other more economical ways of doing it, avoiding the iterated exponentials, but this is very short definitions. Again, we can let sequences number finite sets there. Sequences, you have to take account of the order of the terms there. In a set, you don't take account of that. And so every sequence numbers a finite set, just the finite set of terms of the sequence. And so therefore, if x is an alphabet of numbers, and you think of the language of all words built of that alphabet, then that's just the gradle numbers of finite sets chosen from your alphabet. And so that's my notation. Any question about the uh, notation? Easy gradle numbering. You hardly have to prove anything to make sure that those gradle numbers represent things uniquely. <coughs> now, the power set of integers, we'll pass from the integers to the power set of integers. The power set of integers is a topological space in many ways, but we're going to take a particularly useful topology for this purpose here, which uses just the positive information about a set. So if I have a finite set with variable number n, think of all the subsets of the integers which do contain that finite set. I could get another topology on here, the compact Hausdorff topology, if I thought of both a finite set of integers contained within x and a finite set of integers disjoint with x. That's negative information. But I'm only using the positive part. It's a very good topological space. And for example, the idea of a continuous function there we can read it in words. A function of several variables, where the variables range over the power set of integers, is continuous just in case a finite amount of information <coughs> about the function value is already determined by a finite amount of information about the arguments. You could relate that directly to the epsilon delta definition of continuity over the real numbers there, when you think of rational integrals as a finite amount of information. It's the same way. And it's a very easy definition. And I say it would be easy to teach 
to undergraduates, certainly seniors, but juniors as well. And this is a topology, and I'm going to show you some reasons why this is a very rich topology. I'm going to use this topology in connection with the type-free theory of functions, and it'll turn out that the function application, which is the important thing with setting up the model, is a continuous function in this sense. Are we okay? One thing of why I like this topology on the power set, the topology of positive information there, is it's a T0 space. In point set topology, does anyone know why certain principles are called T principles? Do anyone know why it is? Trennum. Trennum. <laughs> Trenum means separation. Now this is not, T0 is not very much a separation argument like a house door spaces and other ones there. But what it means is every point of the space is uniquely determined by its neighborhoods. And so Alexandrov, many, many years ago when I was only a baby there, realized that it was a very simple proof to show with this topology on the power set of n, any countably based T0 space could be regarded as a subspace because you just map points of the abstract space to the indices of the countable neighborhoods. And of course, every point is uniquely determined by the neighborhoods that contain it. And that passage can be proved to be a topological embedding. Again, even if the juniors haven't heard very much about topology, I could in one lecture period explain how this works out because it's easy set theory. Easy set theory. You do it once you have your definition lined up. But there's a stronger property about this embedding. Think of the power set of integers here, and think of two subspaces. They inherit topology from the superspace. Mm -hmm. So therefore, you can think of continuous functions between subspaces. I don't know who first proved it. I proved it for myself. The power set of n is an injective space. It has a property that if you take con continuous functions from a space into the power set of n, and that space is a subspace of the bigger space, you can always consistently extend the continuous function to the bigger space. So if we're only thinking of subspaces of power set of n, we only need one idea of continuous function. <coughs> continuous functions from power set to power set of give us all possible continuous functions we'll ever need on the subspaces. One notion of continuity there. So now here is a model for untyped lambda calculus. The model consists of power set of n where the subsets of n are, through a girdle numbering, giving you operators, mapping. You can think of it as a lookup table. And these are called enumeration operators. So let me explain how they work here. So take an argument here. Start enumerating x, and then you'll be enumerating the finite subsets of x. Every time you find a finite subset of x, you say, hey, what's your girdle number? Or an appropriate girdle number. Then I go to f as a lookup table here. It's just pairs of integers in f. I say, oh, does that girdle number 
give me permission to output M. If it does give me permission in the lookup table F, I then output this. So as I'm slowly enumerating F, and as I'm slowly enumerating X, I'll be slowly enumerating F of X. That's called an enumeration operator from sex to sex. Now we can just reverse the definition of application to do abstraction there. If I have a correspondence, continuous correspondence from sets to sets, then I just look at what finite sets put in as an argument there, give me as values. I look up, I find out what elements it contains here, and then I make a lookup table say, oh yes, n gave me the permission to output m, and I make that into a lookup table. I throw in zero there because Zero is not the girdle number of a uh, zero is not the girdle number of a pair uh, in this girdle number here. So, in order to get the largest lookup table that gives me the continuous function there, I carefully put two in the zero there. But it's not relevant there. It's only to make sure that it's the largest lookup table. And so the largest lookup table, if the operation is continuous, the largest lookup table will have to give you the right answers. And so uh, that's it. Essentially, the proof for this is a model for lambda calculus. And it's quite clear that application is continuous, a finite amount of information about f of x is already determined by a finite amount of information about the set X and the set F there. And another important thing is the definition of forming the lookup table here. If you have other parameters here and you're continuous in the other parameters and you abstract on one of the variables there, then the resulting combination <coughs> is again a continuous function of the remaining <coughs> parameters. Those are easy exercises to prove. Now, the enumeration operators form the model for the lambda calculus. And every once in a while at 4 o'clock in the morning, much to the consternation of my wife, I kick myself in the butt <laughs> because I could have thought of this when I was a graduate student at Princeton in 1957 because I knew my Helen Shepherdson personally Hartley Rogers came to lecture at Princeton. I met uh, his brilliant student, Richard Friedberg. I heard about enumeration reducibility. Neither of those two groups realized that they had an algebra of operators. Hartley Rogers only used it for enumeration reducibility. He said, if we write y equals f of x, and f is fixed, that f is a method of reducing information about x. It's a method of reducing information about y to information about x via f. And that's Hartley Rogers' enumeration of reducibility when f is recursively enumerable. But it isn't essential when f is recursively enumerable. f can be any enumeration of it. Okay, they didn't realize, either group didn't realize they had an algebra of functions. If only I had thought of it, then I would be rich and famous. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care about famous. <laughs> <laughs> now this model using the power set of integers has a lot of cool properties involving the involving the partially ordered set of integers there. For example, when you're forming lookup tables there, one will be included in the other, just in case the first operator is always pointwise included in the other operator. There are nice properties like that. And of course, lambda abstraction will also preserve positive information in terms of intersection and union there. And there are a lot of other nice properties. A couple of examples. Moreover, 
we now have the way of saying when an enumeration operator of many variables here is computable, it means the total combined lookup table over all the variables is a recursively enumerable set. So we have topology and we have computability here built into the model using what we know about sets, using what we know about recursively enumerable sets. However, the notation of a lambda calculus also gives you a way of explaining computability there because you can also check that the pure lambda terms always define computable operators in terms of this. And moreover, if you use something like Curry's paradoxical combinator, which involves x applied to x, and check out that the combination, according to Curry's scheme there, always gives the least fixed point of the operator, then that means you really have a way of definitions in lambda calculus of doing recursive definitions. And you can make it even stronger there, not just on the pure lambda terms, but there are lots of other good operators there that take advantage of the structure of the integers there. So indeed, successor and predecessor can be promoted to operators on sets and testing to zero there. In other words, you should think of power set of n as being multi-valued integers. And so there's a recursion theory of multi-valued arguments, multi-valued values, in thinking of that as interpretation of the power set. Now, if you use lambda calculus, do recursion in lambda calculus, and start with the arithmetic combinators, you have a notation for every possible RE set, and you can use that even to prove many theorems in recursive function here. I hate to tell you, I hate Turing machines. Mm -hmm. The problem with Turing machines is that the programming is disgusting. <laughs> this is just functional programming with recursion. And I think it's a much better introduction to computability. Turing machines have a philosophical use to them, but I think if you really want to do recursion, Functional programming <coughs> is a better way of doing it. Moreover, we can think easily of functions of several variables if we, if we point out that the space power set of n is the same as its own Cartesian square. Because, of course, you can square things there just by putting a copy of one set on the evens and a copy of the other set on the odds. And so, topologically, the power set of n is topologically the same as its square there. For other types of disjoint unions and function spaces, we have to be a little bit careful there. We can't use the whole power set, we have to use subspaces, and I'll explain that there. Okay, when you realize that the power set of n is its own square, that means any subset of the power set of n can be thought of as a relation because these can be thought of as ordered pairs of sets of integers. And so using that pairing of sets of integers, and I abbreviate it here without using the combinator there, I abbreviate the pairs of sets of integers there. So when you have a set of sets of integers, you can just as well think of that as a binary relation. A little bit of set theory, a little bit of real number. And now the key to getting the model for the Martin Love type theory is to say, now, Curry very much thought of typing things just by using sets of hours in his terminology there. It turns out that you have more flexibility and more structure if instead of just considering sets of things, that is, arbitrary subsets of the power set of integers. What are the subsets of the power set of integers? They're copies of every separable P0 space. You have lots of subsets of the power set of integers. But we're going to go just one little step further there to consider quotients 
a subset of the dark set of energy. So that's more than Curry's types, and it has much more flexibility there. So you can represent forming the quotient just by using an equivalence relation. An equivalence relation is something that is uh, symmetric and transitive. And it doesn't give you the whole space. You only get a subspace there. Those things that are equivalent to themselves are the subspace you're thinking of there. But you have not only those things, but you also have when two of those things are to be regarded as the same according to the quotient. Of course, any subspace, you could take the identity uh, equivalence relation on it to represent a subspace, but we have lots more, if we think, in terms of quotients of subspace. This is an idea that's used over and over in mathematics that you surely know. Bishop emphasized it very much because he said, if you're going to construct the real numbers, it's much more important constructively to use Cauchy sequences with a known modulus of convergence so that when you say, I'm thinking of a real number, I know how I'm going to be approximating it. I have the information about approximating the real numbers. And so, again, the real numbers are a quotient of sequences of rationals, say there. But you have to be careful about how you remember the modulus of convergence of but anyway the idea of taking quotients of subsets is a very, very old idea. So now we'll immediately use the untyped lambda calculus to make this into a category of types. And it has the properties of the types that Martin were wanted there. So what are the mappings from A to B? Remember A and B now are not just thought of as subspaces, they're thought of as quotients of subspaces. They're thought of as equivalent relations. So two mappings F and G are equivalent when you think of going from A to B if equivalent inputs in A give you equivalent output in B. One thing is may be a little surprising there, that this is an unsymmetric definition because the x's and y's occur there in a certain order there. But because A and B are partial equivalence relations, they'll give a proof in predicate calculus. When I teach predicate calculus, I find most of the theorems in predicate calculus excruciatingly boring. Who cares whether two universal quantifiers commute or not? Of course they do. Why do I have to give a proof of that? <laughs> but now you have to give a little bit of proof here using the properties of equivalence relations to show that this is a symmetric and transitive definition. So I think these are good exercises in predicate calculus. And we get a category. And one thing I'll point out is we can, cons we can use the idea of when two things are equivalent, is also a type. In other words, you can look at clumps of the uh, motions there as well, notation. But now we can go on to the further structuring here, and that's what I said. And this, of course, we don't get things on the full power set. Everything has to be restricted to certain kinds of things. So, so of course, the product of two types just means the equivalence relation that gives you equivalences in the first component and equivalences in the second component. And of course, an element has a product type just in case when you think of it as an order there, the first has the first type and the second order and the second type. And now the disjoint sum of two types means you just tag things by means of the pairing function on the sets of integers there, tag them with zeros and ones. And, uh, Either you look at what's in A and tag it with a zero, or look at things what's in B and tag it with a one. And again, very simple ways of thinking of 
when things have that kind of And of course, isomorphism of types here can be defined by very simple formulas. We're really doing third order number theory here. We have the integers at the bottom, but the model consists of sets of integers. And the types consider sets of sets of integers. And so when we're saying that any two types, there's this interesting definition of isomorphism. We just write it out there. There are two functions. One undoes the other one going back and forth between uh, A and B. And now it's a good exercise in predicate calculus to prove if two types are isomorphic and the other two types are isomorphic, then the product sums and function spaces are isomorphic. And so we're getting our construction of this <coughs> Cartesian closed category of types. It's more than the Cartesian closed category because it has disjoint sums. And there are very simple arithmetic rules about isomorphism there. This is, this is really, so to speak, generalized cardinal numbers there. There's an algebra of cardinal numbers involving sums, products, and exponents there. And there are very simple basic rules about cardinality there. And proving those things are very good exercises in functional programming because you say in order to prove this, I have to take data structured a certain way, take it apart and then reassemble it as data structured another way. So the proof of those things are very basic exercises in functional programming from my point of view. So I think Pepe Longo's student, Roberto Ricosmo, proved in his thesis later uh, book there, these are the only laws of isomorphism at this generality. This algebra of isomorphism types, which is a kind of generalized generalization of high school algebra, these are the only laws you can expect of what is general. You can look up the get those laws of those things. Now, the thing that Martin Lerf wanted to do, and then also here, Victor Brown, you might know very well, amazing mathematician who invented auto math and computer checked proofs there and was very close to type theory, made use of dependent types. That is, you not just have one type, you have a family of types. And so the idea is to have a family indexed by types there, you have to make sure that the family respects the equivalence relation. If your arguments are equivalent, then the types have to be equivalent there. So that's what I mean by an A index family of types. And when you have an A index family of types, B of X there, then the Cartesian product of those over there are just all the functions that go from A to B properly. So it means if two things are equivalent there, then they're equivalent over here. And again, you have some asymmetry here, not only with these indices, but here's a one here instead of a, a zero instead of a one. So you have to give a proof to actually show that this is a partial equivalence direction. And of course, anyone who knows about dependent types knows that products of families are the same as function spaces when the family is constant there. And so that's a well-known fact about the relation between types and infinite products. And of course, there are infinite sums, which again, now instead of indexing things by zeros and ones, you have to index things by other elements of another type there. So a sum over A of types B of X there is just in an analogous way of that saying we're taking ordered pairs that are tagged with things chosen from A and things chosen from B there. And again, uh, it's a nice proof to show that that's a partial equivalence relation. 
And of course, uh, infinite sums there are the same as products there because the product is just a very simple tagging of all the elements of the uh, tags from elements of A. Now, you can continue this on to taking pi sigma pi sigma to another one there, but you have to have a system of dependent types where the dependencies fit together properly. So B is dependent on A on the first condition. C is dependent on both A and B, and now there are two variables to think about as shown. D is now dependent on A, B, and C, the three variables there. And if you have this <coughs> respecting of dependencies, that way the last system of types, then you can prove that the combo combination of pi sigma pi is, again, a partial equivalence relation. And of course, it has lots of nice properties that will be useful to. Another interesting fact about this model of types is that the totality of partial equivalence relations, because it's simply defined by a universal quantifier, is a complete lattice. So the intersection of any number of types is a type. The partial equivalence relations are a lattice of equivalences closed on the arbitrary intersection. And so you can say, oh yeah, look, I know some type-free functions that have lots and lots of types there, and in fact, there's a type that's the intersection of all the ones shown there, and so on. Church had originally thinking of uh, integers in terms of iterators, but I noticed, and Plainy said he noticed too, but then Church made him forget it. <laughs> it was only many years later that he admitted that he had thought of it too. There are other ways of using type-free expressions to do arithmetic, and so it turns out that the Scott numerals have a, a very curious type there. And so there are lots of papers and theorems about properties of polymorphic types. By the way, uh, monotone operators on types have both least and greatest fixed points, so there's lots more structure to look at there. I'm about to come to a conclusion here, just a couple more slides. The properties of sigmas and pi's are really the properties of quantifiers. But when you think of saying that asserting a proposition is finding evidence that a certain type is not empty, E is the evidence that P is not empty. When you find that, then you can think of that as a much stronger way of asserting things. It's not just that relations subsist there, but you have specific information about something. And so from that point of view, as many people use, products and sums correspond to conjunction and disjunction. The function space corresponds to implication, and the pi's and sigma's correspond to the quantifiers. So this stronger way of asserting that certain things happen have all the properties of intuitionistic critical calculus. And of course, we're working with things with lots of structure on them. So if I wanted to say, oh yes, I'm thinking of an associative operation, I say, well, how do you know that that's associative operation? I say, well, I can find a specific lambda term made up using my notation that shows that it's associated with there. And so that's doing logic more specifically there by giving the evidence of why things turn out. And people, of course, have worked on that in many, many different ways. Here's something new to leave with you. 
I wish I could work on it myself, but I'm getting to be too old. Lau van den Gries came for the Tarski lectures in Berkeley last year, and he gave a fantastically good lecture on exponential algebra and power series and the developments that have taken place. The book has now appeared that gives a model theory via these fan series, which gives you all kinds of very explicit differential algebra. I can't recommend it too highly. It's a masterwork, and it's only volume one that you're working on volume two. Now it's already 800 pages. But it's really important stuff, a very concrete analysis, using ideas that go back to Hans Hahn and others about infinite power series there. And Tarski brought up the question of exponential algebra and what are the rules of exponential algebra. There's lots of interesting work on Tarski's elementary <coughs> high school algebra problem there. And so they pull all of those things together in an outstanding presentation of differential fields with the current series there. So I asked Lau at the end of his talk, have you considered computational properties of these infinite series? In other words, recursive analysis. And he said, no, you haven't. He's just been doing analysis, algebra, topology, everything that goes with it. But he hasn't considered computability of the things that it's a wide open field to get into to think of that. Here's my proposal. Don't do computable analysis the way the textbooks of the last century did, because they get completely bogged down in girdle numbers. Just horrible computable analysis in my view. But I have here a space power set of n that contains all the necessary structures. There's one topology that inherits the topology to the subplane. There's one notion of computability that inherits notion of computability to all the subspaces. Please make use of it. Look at the trans series work. There's a wide open field there to make it more constructive and computable. And so I plead with you to do it. I don't have any graduate students anymore. I don't have the strength to get into a lot of things there. But the amount that you need to build up the structures there is just based on integers, sets of integers, sets of sets. Of. So that's my conclusion here. <coughs> Not only does this allow you to get to quite complicated structures there, but it's also a laboratory for learning about constructive reasoning, because the work of Bishop, Martin, all of those people in there, collaborators, you can do within this framework. It's not the only model of these things. There are all kinds of other ones there. But this is a laboratory where you could start learning some things about how constructive arguments work. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we have some time for questions. There must be some comments. Why don't we get something to drink instead? <laughs> I'll start out with a comment. Um, you'll be happy. To
you'll be happy to know that one of the things that uh, has received a great deal of attention, of attention around here since you left is an extension of the project that you've sketched here to include also the intentional aspects of Mark, the Martin Luth type theory by adding higher homotopical dimensions and the univalence axiom and so forth, which is a kind of extension of the system you've already mentioned. And not only are we doing that, but we're doing it in the setting that you've presented here involving realizability over the power set of the natural numbers. So we have various aspects of it have been developed. I don't think I can safely say we're completely done, but we have in Bob's group and also in our group uh, develop this realizability model of the system of intentional type theory, univalent type theory, homotopy type theory. And so that gives exactly, as you said, uh, a framework or a, a background setting for doing a computable uh, theory of analysis and even of topology and more recently even some differential smooth uh, differential structure. So there's some very interesting work going on around here, exactly along the lines that you envision. Um, as I said, we're not done, but we're making progress. And there will be several talks about this program coming up this weekend. So yes, I'm really interested to see that. To those things. I mean, yep. uh, fully, fully approved of that whole thing here. You have to be a little bit careful about flavors of realizability. Mm -hmm. There are many different flavors. The ones that Pfefferman used, I don't find as easy to take account of as the kind that I gave here by using the uh, type-free type -free, uh, time calculus. Mm -hmm. But now here's the point I made. I've looked at hundreds of those papers since the early 1960s. I've looked at hundreds of papers involving category theory. I completely approve of the generality and where it is, but it often takes an awfully long time to get into it, okay? Here, in third order number theory, you get your laboratory rather quickly so you can get some familiarity with how things work out mm -hmm. without having a full blast into the category theory. Mm -hmm. So, I'm suggesting for beginners, maybe there's a way to wrap up to doing those and you need those other developments. I will make a certain warning though. Uh, I've known lots and lots of people in category theory. Bill Rivera, for example, uh, introduced uh, infinitesimals and it led to Synthetic differential geometry. Yeah. Anders Koch from Denmark wrote excellent books on that. And I thought the definitions were totally beautiful, but I'm not aware that the synthetic differential geometry solved problems that mathematicians wanted solved about differential structures. Certainly, the proofs they gave there were much more logical, but they were using things that were already known, but reinterpreting in a better language. But we have to solve new problems all the time. So that's my warning there. Be careful about your generality there. You won't get mathematicians to listen to you unless you solve new problems. That's great. Thank okay, you. Was one, question. one more question. Sorry, just a naive question. Though. Your last bullet point says propositions as types uh, in so in, in the model that your uh, yes. um, the power set and that power set and power set model. Uh, you yes. say propositions as types will then enforce using constructive logic. Uh, I thought propositions as types sort of always enforce using constructive logic, but maybe I don't know what you mean by enforce. Uh oh. The model is built up in classical logic, but when you say to insert a, propos assert a proposition means to find evidence for it, yes. then that's a stronger condition, and that's what makes you 
argued constructively. I guess my question is, is that a feature in some way that I, I don't understand of this particular model you're suggesting, or just the... No, 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 people have... It's yeah. the... Uh, sometimes very called curry Howard isomorphism there, but this is a little bit more specific version of it, but people have been talking about that for a very long time, and, and so it's very closely related to realizability interpretations of intuitionistic logic. And so it says that you force yourself to be intuitionistic in your arguments if you insist on exhibiting the evidence that's necessary to reach the conclusion. Doesn't that make sense? I, I don't really know what realizability means, I guess. But, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> yeah, it means you find the evidence. Oh, I realize why that's true, because I just found the evidence. <laughs> It's not a mystical word. <laughs> okay. Okay, before we thank Dana one last time, let me invite you all to a reception where you can come and visit a little bit with Dana and with each other and have some snacks and drinks. Uh, upstairs in Baker Hall 135.